uh, webinar of the year. We got off to a little slow start, uh, but we are now uh, ready to roll out uh, our normally free webinars, as you are on, and we're going to be launching some extended webinars that will have a small fee attached to it, but you will be able to earn credits and certificates. So uh, more about that uh, in upcoming webinars. Uh, today's topic, five challenges to managing big data, uh, came about uh, when I was visiting a conference, when I was attending a conference and visiting some friends uh, from the Philippines, and I asked her, you know, what's on your mind and from a quality point of view and I excellence point of view, and she said, well, we need to know how to manage big data. And I said, well, what's the big deal? It's just data, and you sample data, and you do it right. And she says, no, no, we, there's, a, there's a thing out there about managing big data sets. And so, although I'm well aware of the importance of uh, managing data, I thought it would be good if we started to do some research and, and um, make some edits to the new upcoming jury in handbook number seven. And so, the result of my uh, researching and the result of my inquiries about managing big data uh, is part of the presentation today. Uh, this is not a statistical analysis presentation, although it could get rather technical if we were to extend it. Uh, it's not an IT uh, program discussion. It's mainly a business discussion. I want to share with you uh, what we've learned and what I've learned about the differences and difficulties of managing big data. Uh, and so my intent was to give you a presentation that you might be able to pass on to others so that they could get a head start or a better understanding. Uh, many of our clients, obviously we teach statistical analysis and, and data analytics and we help our clients improve performance. And some of them are small, some of them are large. Uh, many of them have very large data systems and they're always having difficulty uh, pulling information out of data, and the more you have, the more difficulty you have. So hopefully um, we can give you some information that might make it easier or at least get a better discussion going in your organization. Uh, IBM a couple years ago published uh, this information, and now keep in mind IBM is a data analytic company, so it might be a little biased towards them, but uh, in this publication they identified that Organizations that were outperforming others uh, had strategies, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, they were using to deliver results. Uh, and as you can see from here, the common theme here obviously is that leaders are more likely to make better decisions based on data, rather historically from just gut feel, uh, and it's almost 200% more likely than the non-performers. They were two times more likely to have formal career paths for analytics, meaning uh, you can't get to leadership positions anymore without truly understanding the importance of uh, data mining, data analysis, and then the interpretation of that and turning that into decision making, which is the whole purpose of data mining. 75% of the leaders uh, cite growth as the key source of value from analytics because uh, in many cases, you can get more information that might make you more competitive or might make you understand better what the customer meant or needs and therefore capitalize on that so it impacts your uh, sales side of the house. Um, the 80% felt that the positive impact of investing in analytics was well worth it. Uh, 60% uh, have predictive analytics capability. And uh, as we think about problem solving and getting information to solve the problem, and we get that information from data, and that data um, is coming from historical performance, the speed and the magnitude of the data we have today can have actually enable us to predict performance more readily and more quickly. Um, because it's coming in in real time and much faster and greater than ever. And lastly, leaders from uh, some form of shared leaders had some form of shared analytic resources. So we know um, leadership is dealing with big data, particularly on the consumer side. If you're in pharmaceuticals or healthcare, you're dealing with human populations and they're larger than they've ever been. 
So capitalizing big data from IBM showed that leaders really need to know it. So my purpose of this session is to really help you do that. Here's some pretty interesting ways to start thinking about big data. Um, you know, every 60 seconds, 98,000 tweets, almost 700,000 updates on Facebook, 11 million instant messages, 700,000 Google searches, 170 million emails sent, uh, 1.8 terabyte of data created, and 217 new mobile web users. Now, why is that? that have anything to do with us? Well, it's just to give you the idea that the technology today is creating many more opportunities to interpret all these devices, all these locations, and extract useful information from it, hence the term big data. And to arrive at uh, those kind of numbers, if you look at the chart here, uh, we have these huge mainframe computers that are out there collecting information um, and interchanging between client servers and the Internet and then all these uh, social media places. So the magnitude, the scope, the geographical dispersion, the speed, all that is creating a new IT threat and a new IT opportunity for most of us. Now, whether your organization is dealing with large data and massive data, or you are just still dealing with what we might consider to be the normal amount of data needed to run a business, uh, you probably will be faced with using some of these databases to interpret or understand your customer. If you're in a hospital system, uh, the information being collected, uh, not just on patient satisfaction, but on the type of disease they had, the duration of the disease while they were in the ho the duration of their stay in the hospital, the medications that they used, the impact of those medications, the time of day, all that information being collected will now be available. It is available for those who want to find if there's any pattern to this. So we see a lot of massive data being used in research development, product development, uh, and in general operations. Uh, another way to look at uh, why big data is important, uh, you can see some examples here. In this chart, there's all different types of data. Uh, there's real-time data versus batch data. Historically, uh, when we're problem solving, we are looking backwards uh, at data usually in batches due to sampling uh, because we can't look at it all. Or if we're collecting new data, we tend not to do 100% data collection, so we do sampling. So in the lower corner, you have this structured batching up to a very unstructured batch. And then if you go across the top, it's real time. And you can just get some ideas uh, who's doing what. And so if you think about a bank giving out loans and monitoring either individuals that have a loan or are taking out borrowing money, keeping track on a real-time basis that person's spending habits to avoid them going into default. Uh, I think American Express, Visa, uh, most banks today all offer you automatic monitoring of your credit score. Uh, that real-time information as being used by someone to observe and see, can we give this person more credit cards? Can we avoid uh, risk of losing payments on credit cards? Um, and if you you know work your way down the list, you'll see various things like demand forecasting and ma manufacturing. Uh, can we anticipate the with better precision the accuracy of who's going to buy what product, and therefore we don't have to manufacture as many or put as many in inventory if they don't sell. So the very Various uses of big data analytics uh, is happening, and I'd like to ask you a question. And uh, you can, at any time, as Scott said, raise your hand or ask a question, but I'm going to do a couple of polls here. Uh, is your organization right now learning how to manage big data? Uh, and I realize that's a very uh, vague question, but so that you all can see who's on the line. Um, 
say about 55 to 45 percent. Kind of looks like our political uh, issues over here today, running for primaries. Uh, and I'm going to do a follow-up question as well, um, mainly because it, you know I don't know who you are, what you're doing. Um, but the second question is, oops, sorry, I jumped too far. The poll below it, sorry. Uh, what kind of difficulties are you actually having if you are managing big data? And uh, I realize that's now there on the screen. Um, so some of you said storing and you know storing warehouses of data, uh, multiple disjointed systems. Uh, if I hear one more time, we're trying to get our systems to talk to each other. Um, compiling the data from various locations. Having a hard time figuring out what is critical. So although I can't answer them all, uh, we can record these and, and we can use them in future webinars, I'm going to try to tackle some of them um, so that maybe you can have more information uh, to go home and, and talk to your bosses about. Uh, I also would like to see your questions pop up. So let me ask by a show of hands, do you know how to use the question button? Now I asked you two questions there. Do you know how to raise your hand? And can you use the question? Good, good, good. And by the way, if you ask questions, I'm going to uh, give away some free items here at the end. So I'll pull one response from those who ask questions or respond, and uh, one who just because you stayed on till the end, uh, we will include you in that. So let's go back to the show. OK. Got a lot of yeses there. Good. Thank you, folks. Uh, one day we're going to be able to do this real-time FaceTime. So one thing I want to share with you, uh, and, and this is our Duran point we want to make, no matter how big the data set or how complicated the method, if the bits and bytes of data don't give you useful information that answers clear questions with action implications, it's merely noise. Meaning, whether you're looking at big data or little data, if you, if you are not getting the information you need, the size of the database isn't going to be mat matter to you. John Early is one of our uh, is the statistician in our organization, and he works for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, he is someone who you don't want to get in a fight with when it comes to analysis of data. Uh, and we'd like to make this point because we teach root cause analysis. We teach green belts, black belts, Six Sigma. And one of the most difficult things is to get people to understand that you have to collect data, you have to uh, plot the data, you have to interpret the data to make decisions. Uh, and, and part of that data comes from possibly 100% data collection or sampling. And sampling 10,000 data points, uh, sampling 10,000 databases, or sampling from 100,000 databases require very different means of doing it, but in the end, you still need to be able to provide information that is useful. Already from the poll uh, that you just took here, looking at some of the comments, um, you could see um, you know, how to access very, various locations. Uh, we have a lot of garbage in our system. We don't trust it. Uh, those things are going to be the same whether you have small data or large data. And understanding how to manage and collect data properly is going to be a benefit. And although I'm not going to teach you that here, I just want to state and clearly point out that you still have some of the issues to deal with. But there are differences in dealing with big data. And I'm going to make sure we highlight them. So small data or big data, you still have inherent variability everywhere. And it impacts good and bad. Uh, and it will create uncertainty in decision making. So how much risk are you willing to take when you collect data, analyze it, and interpret it? And that collection of data requires sampling. So how much inherent variability will there be if you sample a million data points out of a billion? Uh, if you sample a uh, 100 million out of a trillion? there is so much opportunity for more variability if you just grab the wrong data set. 
So that's the same as little or big. Uh, assuring the data is accurate. Most of you complain that you get garbage in, garbage out. You've got disjointed systems that aren't working. And we're trying to pull information out of those systems. And we find that the information may have been inaccurate, uh, may have been missing. And so we don't have accurate data. Therefore, we don't have good decisions. Now, the question is, how much risk are you willing to take? Uh, tools like measurement system analysis, uh, good gauge r and &R, help minimize collection of bad data and help us interpret some of the bad data. But when you're dealing with trillions of data points, it's clearly going to become a bigger problem. Um, having clearly specified physical models of what is being analyzed, uh, you know, we assume when we Google or do a search, we're going to get accurate information. We do that too with data. But we also don't know all the different ways people put data in. Did they interpret it properly? Did they not interpret it properly? So any of the physical models you're being used, those also probably are going to be impacted. And then lastly, knowing the inherent limitations of your assumptions uh, in the methods being used. All data and analytics come down to decision making and how much risk we are willing to take. If we are just trying to determine uh, whether a consumer is going to buy our good tomorrow, in certain placement on the shelf, that's one level of risk. Or if we're determining what medication to give cancer patients that might turn around their cancer is a whole different set of risk. The more risk you have, the less risk you want, the more difficult and more important implications you have from mining big data and not getting the right answer. So what does big data provide us? Well. First of all, it gives us so much information so much faster. Uh, we can get experiments, observations, simulations in so many areas uh, in huge, huge amounts. I didn't even know the term petabytes existed. Um, and uh, I've been working with a science organization recently and where nanoseconds was a very fast time, we are looking at time frames at the atomic level, which are obviously much faster. But the requirement of science is forcing us going to both ends of the scale. Um, most of you probably had a four, uh, maybe a four megabyte, then gigabyte, and now terabyte, and a bunch of them of data storages on your shelf, on your computer, or in the cloud. Uh, obviously, those are being filled up with all kinds of this stuff. Uh, analysis of the information contained in these sets have led to major breakthroughs. Uh, particularly in the genome. Uh, with the billions and billions of data points uh, to map the genome and then interpreting that information, we've been able to come up with new medications, new ways to test, new ways to treat uh, sicknesses. Um, we've done the same thing. I came out of an uh, astronomical type company in my early in my career. And when you're dealing, of, dealing in light years and billions of light years, uh, you've got quite a bit of information that you're collecting, and now with this information, you're able to determine that we've got new planets and new new black holes and, and emerging solar systems, et cetera. The traditional methods of analysis um, have been largely on the assumption that we can work with the data within the confines of our own computing environment, but now we're also looking at someone else's environment. Uh, and lastly, this big data is changing the paradigm that the traditional methods uh, aren't going to be good enough for us. And these methods have to change because the data is distributed across many, many different data storage environments. And with that, uh, not just speed, but with that comes uh, difficulty in assuring that all the data is rich and good. Uh, by a show of, oh, here we go. Uh, by a show of hands, um, and I can also see by how many people come and go here, um, is there a specific instance that you believe as a professional process improvement person that you, you are now dealing with data sizes that are much, much larger than you did four or five years ago? Uh, in other words, the problem solving you're doing or the process control you're doing you're dealing with such large data points. I'd just like to see how many of you are dealing with that today.
Uh, obviously, uh, I see an old friend, Mark Novotny, Dr. Novotny, who's in a uh, CMO of a hospital, and I see you've got obviously a lot of data to deal with. Okay. Um, and those of you who aren't, you're affected by it, and you are a data point in many different data banks. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so where's all this information? And the most I could do is give you some examples. Obviously, we know that Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, all these inter company, inter internet-based companies uh, have tremendous amount of data, data that comes from each of us providing information. So if you've got a billion users, and those billion users regularly update their folders and files and Facebooks and everything, they are accumulating that information, not just the information of you, but when you go on, how long you stay, where you go, what you shop for, uh, and the faster that they can interpret that information, the faster they could benefit from it. And, and they also, if you think about these large Internet-based companies, they sell that information. So if you have Google Analytics and you're a company like ours and you want to run ads, uh, you basically buy into their system and the information they have. Uh, it used to be uh, advertise and you'd get an email from an adv advertiser. Now you go online, uh, you start to search, and immediately every time you go onto your Facebook or every time you go onto a site, the things that you were looking for, all of a sudden the advertisers are showing up. And that's real-time analytics looking at millions of bytes of information where they pinpoint and target their users and their customers, and it shows up at your door. So all this social media stuff is uh, creating an unbelievable amount of data that can be sold and used by consumer companies, uh, and not just the social media, but there are so much, so many ways to collect information electronically. Uh, for instance, in hospitals, there's so much data recording about illnesses today. The government requires it uh, from patients, from doctors, from nurses, from care administrators uh, to be paid. And the amount of transactions and the amount of payments and the amount of illness uh, and claims is all there to be data mined. And so when we look at trying to to cure disease, when we look at trying to uh, deal with large-scale economic issues, there is so much data out there, that data mining it. Um, and I guess the one most popular one these days, if you watch uh, anything related to the NSA, where people are looking at trillions and trillions of data a second through uh, for cybersecurity reasons or national intelligence. So what are some of the challenges and some of the benefits? Well, obviously, the challenge uh, can span the generation of the data, how to prepare for analysis, uh, any policy-related challenges. That means what can we look at, what can't we look at, how do we share it, how are we going to use it. Um, and some of the things that uh, you're always going to be thinking about with regular small data, you have to think even more importantly about large data. Uh, usually, the smaller the data set, the n we know more where it came from. The larger the data set, the more variation in where it came from, and therefore the more variation in response. So dealing with highly distributed data sources, uh, you know, just looking at different cultures, different countries, they might have different ways of interpreting things. Uh, tracking data from data generation through preparation, validating the data, uh, having any biases or understanding the biases, heterogeneity, <laughs> heterogeneity of the data, working with different formats and structures and talking to each other. Um, and, and, you know, for simple process analysis folks, we use tools like Jump and Minitab and even Excel's um, you know, tools to take some of the data, put box plots, scatter plots. Well, those aren't going to be enough anymore. You're going to need algorithms that's going to have to go in and pull data. You're going to need algorithms that are going to have to analyze that data. And therefore, the complexity of your process analysis toolkit is going to get that much greater. Uh, when people ask, you know, what do we do beyond Six Sigma in terms of methods, this is probably the area of quality analysis that uh, is going to probably push the skills of our industry further, uh, mainly because we're going to be dealing with these larger data sets. Um, 
ensuring data integrity, security. Uh, and, and by the way, every time you mine data, you create new information that other people are looking for as they're mining. So securing the information you have and maintaining it is also very important. Uh, develop methods for visualizing data. And I'm gonna, I'll have a couple pictures here in a moment, but uh, you, know, you can't just read everything. You can't read a billion data points. So pictures, colors, uh, sounds are gonna become more important. Uh, as I said, scalable and incremental algorithms, and then uh, how do you take all that and do real-time analysis and decision-making? Um, so I'm glad some of you are meeting each other online here. I think we have a new uh, Duran Meet a Friend portal. It looks like someone just uh, ran into somebody on our little chat there, so congratulations. Uh, I'm glad we found some friends for you. Uh, big data, why it's important? Well, because number one, it gets more accurate, faster decision-making. That's pretty simple. Uh, the longer it takes to get information, the, the smaller your window becomes to see through. So the faster you get it and the more accurate you get it. Uh, you can result in less uh, compliance failures, uh, fewer recalls. Uh, let me give you a recall example. I think um, uh, Snickers or one of the candy bar companies, there was a piece of plastic found in it, and they did a recall in 55 countries uh, for I believe it was Snickers. I'm, I'm sorry if I was wrong. I'm not going to go on. Uh, it was Mars, actually. Thank you. And a way to think about this in terms of compliance failures or costly recalls, if we knew exactly the, the lot, the amount, the place where that plastic might have been found, and we had that data in real time, maybe we could minimize the impact of that recall. Maybe we could minimize uh, the impact of any failure. Uh, so that's the, the drama behind that. Uh, we can make cost reductions faster and bigger. Uh, we can get more sales to customers because if a customer comes in looking for something that we don't have and our competitor has it and we find they have that, then we can easily try to sell them something else. Uh, process time, all the usual things that come with uh, improved process. That's why it's important. Uh, and if, if many of you in non-data-driven environments hate Managing little data, you're probably not going to like managing big data because right now everybody needs it, everybody has it, and it's only going to get more of it. Um, and when you get more data over longer periods of time, it's going to take a lot more um, kind of non-individual analysis to take a look at that data. So you see more team efforts at analyzing and interpreting data. But all of our industries uh, have this big data, and you're all dealing with it. Uh, I can't tell what industries you're from, but I did mention healthcare a couple times. Can I just see by a show of hands how many of you are in the healthcare supply chain? And that means hospitals, pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Uh, and the reason I bring this one up, other, other than probably uh, banking, uh, it's probably the one that's generating the most amount of data, not necessarily information that's out there. If you're in banking, obviously you've got even probably a hundredfold more data bytes out there. Uh, but these are areas, and more recently, manufacturing, uh, although when you're managing and monitoring billions of parts, that's one thing. But manufacturing may start benefiting from uh, monitoring environmental factors, from uh, doing a genome of material itself and find out what characteristics it has. So. Uh, more and more, it's going to be a bigger and bigger issue, so be prepared. Uh, where does the data come from? Well, we mentioned streaming data. Uh, anywhere from the Internet or all these connected devices. Uh, social media data, uh, any of the interactions we have. And then publicly available data. Um, and that kind of data comes from uh, one and two, plus it comes from compliance data where we have to provide information um, information on census, information on health, information on um, um, credit scores, all that information is out there for the taking and the, and the asking and the paying at times. Uh, so it's all there. Uh, examples of it, as we said, advertising and marketing, uh, governing, health care, uh, you name it, we got it. And your job is to sift through it and find out how it can all help you. So 
The topic was the five challenges. So we boiled this down to five challenging challenges. And, and this first one is a, is a lesson learned uh, as a more novice data guy, although I've been doing this for 30 years. Number, one, uh, number five, dealing with big data is not the same as less data. Yes, we want to turn data into information which enables decisions to be made regardless of the amount of data points. And yes, we, understand the, the, we have to understand the problem we're solving and what decision we need to make, but the risks are different. There's so much more uh, risk in picking the wrong data if you're sampling or trying to use too much data. Um, and uh, an, example of, an example of this, I was, I was working in a research environment, and I was at a research environment, and they were talking about taking um, physical samples from human intestines. And we have many, many feet of human intestine. And they said, well, where do we sample from? Uh, if we sample from you know, one part, will the other part be a similar result? And would that be from another result? And the question was, well, not so much where should we sample, but how can we perform a sample in multiple places on a given patient because that in itself causes problems. So one of the solutions was that we need to have X more people and each one have different samples or samples taken from different locations in their intestines so that we could look at them. And that's the kind of thing when we think about uh, in terms of sampling and getting the right picture. Because if we make a decision based on uh, one piece of a long item, then we might get the wrong answer. Um, and no, you cannot use the same sampling or analytic techniques that you did with small data. Uh, mainly, the collection itself is, is going to be overwhelming. So you need something to go get it. And then the means to interpret it is going to be just as difficult. So my fifth challenge is dealing with big data is not the same. And if anybody tells you it is, send them to me. Uh, it's different. It's different in volume. It's different in variety. And so important, it's different in velocity. Think of, think of um, every time you search the web, the speed at which something comes back with 100 million hits. That velocity is one issue. In other words, you've got it fast. That in itself may sound good from a data collection, data interpretation point of view. But if we're looking at patterns over time, how far back do we look? Do we look at you know, 100 million data points every day for the last year, five years, 10 years. So the interpretation, because of the velocity, drives the volume. The volume then and it, it forces us to start challenging and creating more risk as to what data we're pulling and how we're interpreting it. Uh, and really, the big word in, in a lot of the big data is the inferential part. We're inferring from what we collect that it's representative of a larger body. And those inferences could be good and they could be bad, depending on how accurate uh, we pull that information out and use it. And then the third part is the variety. So we call the three Vs of data, big data, velocity, volume, and variety. There's so much stuff out there, uh, and we have to be careful that we don't try to... And this is the problem. A lot of companies have SAP or big, big um, database systems, and problem-solving teams say, we, we have all the data in SAP. Well, number one, pretty good chance you don't have all your data in SAP. And secondly, that system only collects data it needs, and so, uh, but it does have a lot of variety. So when we think about data systems we have, you're probably going to start to go beyond your systems and look in other systems, and so you do have quite a bit of variety. Number four, uh, we're unsure how to store, many organizations are unsure how to sort and store, or store and sort this information. Um, obviously, every organization begins to store its information in their own databases. Then those databases go to 
warehouse databases. Then those databases also go to the cloud. And then those databases connect to other databases, etc. So how to store it, and how to store it in large volumes, how to access it, and how to uh, protect it. Um, what parts of the data do I analyze? Do I need it all? Uh, are we, and, and one of the thoughts I had was, we tend to look at data when we're looking for trends over history, some period of time. And going back to a, my comment earlier, good data analytics comes from good questions to ask. So if I said, what has the consumer thought about product X over the last three years, and I got that information, could I have gotten that same information from 100 million more data points over the last three weeks? And would I have made the same decision? In other words, if I looked at the data that's coming in in a very short period of time, but because there's so much of it, would that be an infer uh, interpretive of all the patterns over the last three years? Because people's patterns also change quick. Uh, third, get help you need early on. Um, you know, there are, if you're a big company and you've got big data, there's a pretty good chance that the people you have internally uh, are not the experts on managing big data. And, and I will tell you, I'm not. Uh, and we are clearly going to try to ramp up to make sure that we have a team of folks that are capable of dealing with these large vats of data. And the last one, when you're managing big data or storing it, you know, where's your data coming from? Uh, there are so many people out there selling um, data. You just don't know what sample, where it came from, how you got it. Um, someone here online said, uh, save, or, we're, we have such a big volume of data, it's quite impossible to store it for three to five years. Um, that's becoming another issue is how long do you store data um, because you're going to keep building warehouses of data banks. And I don't have that answer, but I'm sure somebody will come up with uh, some low-cost use of it. Uh, number three, uncertainty of what strategy you use or lack of direction. In other words, how do we start to solve our problem? How do we think about all this data in trying to solve our problem? And, and this is where it's similar to managing small data. You really have to understand uh, what you're trying to solve, what you want to improve, uh, and then work your way backwards. And all data interpretation begins with what are the questions you're trying to answer. And so trying to target your answer more tightly, like increasing sales in a specific segment versus what are all the customer needs and what are they buying everywhere. Uh, trying to go after specific types of advertisement. Instead of saying, you know, what drives the consumer to do this, say, how, how does my consumer respond to my marketing material? Uh, so the narrower the question, the better chance you're going to have at interpreting the data and getting the right data. The broader the question, that means the broader the data and the bigger the problem. And so uh, that uncertainty and lack of direction is probably going to get resolved in one of our tips is uh, with uh, data analysis teams that have enough intelligence in the in this subject as well as analytical capabilities to be able to minimize the risk of getting the right answer. Uh, so if you think about big data analytics, this is one picture that I found that was uh, just illustrative that you've got this huge amount of sources, you're extracting data you're enriching it, which means you are turning it into information, and then you deliver it. Uh, the delivery of it, and if you do that it's in a nanosecond, you've got it made. Uh, the problem we have is, do we access the right sources? Do we extract the data properly? Uh, is it good enough for what we need? And do we know how to enrich it? And enriching it really means do we know how to pull the information from data. Uh, contrary to most people, I would rather see warehouses full of information rather than warehouses full of data. But one person's data is another person's information, and one person's information is another person's data. It's all dependent on what you're trying to do. 
Uh, challenge number two, uh, lack of assuredness on how to use the information. Uh, right now, we make a lot of bad decisions with the data we have. Let's get more of it and let's see how bad our decisions come from then. Uh, so there's going to be more emphasis placed on importance of experimenting and testing, uh, testing out your theories and hypotheses, uh, and then taking the information and before, and before you um, release all that knowledge into new products or services, probably going to see more testing and validating that the information we got from large databases are more true and better. Uh, and if you think about it, historically, we would look at smaller databases, get information, make decisions based on that, launch a product, and that product would sell 80% of what we thought it would sell or use 90% of the time. This way here, we're probably going to see more information collected, better understanding of what's driving behavior, do some testing of that, then ramp up, then sell, and get a 90% sale. Um, I think with open source data out there and other best practice sharing methods, uh, you can also uh, move that faster and minimize the bad data decisions. And lastly, uh, the number one challenge of managing data, uh, being paralyzed by the vast amount of information you have. For the past uh, 30 years, um, we and I have participated in many, many problem-solving teams and process analysis work and data analytics. And I'm amazed at how frightened people get when they have to interpret 125 data points and find a pattern in that, or find the mean, mode, and median of six digits, uh, or be able to track 23 data points for a control chart to be effective. Think about that same person who you might be one of. Now being put into a position, I got my green belt training, my black belt training, I'm a lean expert, and now I'm going to a company, and the first thing they say is, we have 100 million users, and we need to solve these problems. We have a billion claims. How do you do it? So the, you get overwhelmed very quickly, and that overwhelmingness leads to paralysis. You just don't know what to do. And so uh, you're going to, uh, like me, when I responded to my friend from the Philippines, I said, what are you worried about big data for? You manage it the same way a little data. So there's a resistance because you think you know what you're talking about. Um, IT folks, although they love IT, I don't think they ever were put in a position to have to manage so much information in so many directions. Uh, so we, we have this either paralysis or we try to rush to do things. And with big data, I think uh, rushing to analysis is going to create bigger and bigger problems. Um, I think one of my fears is that uh, misinterpreting large databases when it comes to science or technology, and we put some uh, pretty big stakes in the ground by making some decisions or new drugs or, or, or um, medical advances based on the wrong information. You can see where that's going to go. Um, be aware of the biases. There's going to be a lot more bias because if we're teaching our own staff how to collect data and how to collect that data with less, less bias and then interpret it properly, can you imagine not being able to control the people who collected that data? So you've, you've got to be well aware of the biases in, in that. Uh, a good example for those who are in the United States or foreigners who are watching our, our you know, national elections, uh, the polling that takes place has been all over the place. And my belief, it has a lot to do uh, with the bias that all these organizations are using and also the ability of a person to change their mind rather quickly and not capture it. So beware of that. Uh, and lastly, any conclusions that you have from your data analysis are supposed to be clear, succinct, and um, you know, devoid of any variable you can't control. And here you know there's going to be more variation. So the paralysis that comes with large data uh, is going to be a problem for all. If we look at the world out there, uh, I found this picture online. Um, and it doesn't make mean much to me. 
But it just shows all the different, in most of these organizations weren't even here 10 years ago, um, but the different technologies, the infrastructures, the operationally, uh, analytically, all the apps that are coming and going, the business intelligence, uh, there's a lot already going on in the big data landscape world. Um, I think we all take it for granted that the cloud uh, is um, a place in heaven where we get our data. Uh, but in fact, these organizations have been building warehouses and warehouses of physical structures, holding all that information uh, and providing it to us. And you're probably part of that big data landscape, either as a customer, supplier, or um, a data point or more. So when you start to try to be less overwhelmed and you look out there, um, you're going to find a whole crop of new people uh, that are learning just as you are how to deal with the same situation. Now, I will tell you there is hope. Uh, there is a wonderful document uh, that I used as uh, part of our research. And if you uh, go to the uh, link here, uh, which is part of the National Academy of Science, uh, this, it's actually a book, but you could download the PDF for free. I think it's the most succinct, best, well-written, non-for-profit, like the IBM survey uh, data, that if you really want to get your hands around data collection, uh, data analysis of massive data, this would be the document. Uh, I just happened to be doing some work with the National Science Foundation. Uh, my daughter-in-law worked for the National Academy of Science, and I made a comment. She said, oh, check this out. And it has become, I believe, my go-to my go-to document. So I would like to uh, leave that with you. And also, um, oh, there's no last slide. So I'm going to leave that with you. And also, oh, here we go. And also open it up to some comments, some questions. Uh, if you've been on my webinars before, uh, we've had more pictures and more moving documents. Uh, I found that this topic was a difficult one to present without having a lot of dialogue. Uh, so I hope you uh, didn't find that uh, less interesting. Um, and I also now would like you to uh, pass on any questions you have. Um, someone did ask a question, will Six Sigma evolve to support big data analysis? Um, I think I think the answer, the, the real question should be, are Six Sigma process analysis practitioners able to evolve, and are they evolving, not will they? In other words, we have no choice. We have to learn. We're going to have to learn how to manage. I mean, our job is diagnostician. Our job is process analysis. Therefore, we have to interpret data. So if you're going to be in an organization where there's massive amounts of data, then we have to evolve. Uh, I guess a point you could raise here is, is Six Sigma good enough when dealing with this massive amount of data? And um, Because one of the things about massive data is you get long tails in your frequency distribution. So maybe Eight Sigma is going to become the uh, mantra, or Ten Sigma is going to become the mantra. Who knows? Um, What might the algorithms for big data be like? I have no clue. But I will tell you, we have a benchmarking practice where we have uh, very different types of data, and we put it through an algorithm, which we call the complexity factor. Uh, and uh, it would take me about an hour just to put the characters in the right order for you to understand it. So, and that's a simple thing. Uh, I don't know it, but I will tell you this. The, the document that I put onto you, uh, is actually have quite a bit, uh, quite a bit of information about sampling techniques, et cetera. Uh, 